So, um, what we've seen so far is that if we have a matching model with rigid wedge, um, we are able to generate fluctuations in unemployment and vacancies uh, and um, labor market like this that describe well what we see in the US labor market. So in particular, when uh, productivity when labor productivity fluctuates, we're able to generate uh, uh, fluctuations in unemployment. So in good times, unemployment will be low. In bad times, unemployment will be high. We are also able to generate a negative correlation between unemployment and vacancies. Exactly. So basically, we're able to generate a beverage curve. So that in good times, you have a lot of vacancies. In bad times, you have very few vacancies. And we are also able to generate uh, pro-cyclical fluctuation in tightness. So in good times, the tightness of the market is high. So it means that there are many vacancies compared to uh, unemployed workers. And as a result, it's easy for workers to find jobs. It's difficult for firms to fill vacancies. And in bad times, the tightness is low. So it's hard for workers to find jobs. And it's easy for firms to fill vacancies. And we also showed that um, the size of the fluctuations in unemployment that we get from the model, they match or even exceed uh, the size of the fluctuation that we see in the real world, which is, uh, which is usually a, a challenge with standard model, whereas with our matching model with a rigid wedge, we can do that very easily. Um, so this means that the matching model with rigid wedge is something that we can readily use to describe uh, business cycle fluctuations on the labor market. Now, it turns out that in the literature, um, typically the most common uh, wage function that's used is not a rigid wage, but it's a bargain wage. Either with Nash bargaining, something we haven't um, studied here, or with surplus sharing, something that we have analyzed. And it turns out that in many simple cases, surplus sharing or Nash bargaining give you exactly the same wage. So it's not a very meaningful difference. It's more of a technical difference between using the Nash bargaining solution or using surplus sharing. A uh, difference that often uh, is actually inexistent. Um, so the question is, uh, given that surplus sharing has been used a lot in the literature, can we use it? Can we use a wage that comes out of surplus sharing to describe uh, business cycle fluctuations? Um, and this question is actually the question that's analyzed by Scheimer in uh, 2005 articles that assigned as a reading. And just to give you an overview, what we'll find actually is that for realistic calibration of the parameters, it turns out that uh, the way that comes out from, of uh, surplus sharing is too flexible. Um, so it absorbs too much of fluctuations in productivity. And as a result, unemployment doesn't fluctuate enough in the model to capture what we see in the real world. So that's why actually uh, using a bargain wage, such as the wage that comes out of surplus sharing, is not going to be very helpful to describe business cycle because it's going to lead to very dampen business cycle fluctuation. So we're going to show that uh, in this lecture. So what we're studying here is a matching model with bargained wage. So if you go back uh, to the previous uh, lecture, you will see that uh, the bargain wage, so we computed the wage, the wage bargaining solution that we've adopted is that of uh, surplus sharing. And uh, According to that solution, we saw that uh, the wage that's going to prevail is given by 1 minus beta times z, where beta is worker's bargaining power, z is the flow value from being unemployed for workers, plus beta times the marginal product of labor 
times 1 plus r theta, where theta, as usual, is the labor market thickness and r is the recruiting cost. So that's our general expression for the wage. So here you can see um, that this expression for the wage is much more complicated than what we had when we uh, used the rigid wage, um, where the wage is depending only on um, one parameter, labor productivity. Here the wage depends on a bunch of parameters, such as the bargaining power, the value of unemployment, the recruiting cost. In addition, the wage also depends on um, variables of the model, such as tightness, uh, and also uh, employment, because the marginal product of labor in general is given by alpha a n alpha minus one, where n is the number of producers. So your marginal product of labor also depends on variables. So your wage really depends on a bunch of things. Um, so here, what we are going to do to simplify a bit the analysis, um, we'll follow the tradition in the literature which is to uh, focus on a linear production function, which is a special case of what we've been uh, doing now. So here we have to do that because um, so our production function is going to be simpler than before, before we allow for um, any um, concave function. So here we we'll focus on the linear case. That's to be able to Kind of absorb the extra complexity that come from using a bargain wage instead of a rigid wage. So we have more complexity on the wage side. So to keep the model, you know, analytically um, tractable, we are going to reduce the complexity on the production side. So we assume a linear production function. So our production function will give us an output that's just a times n, where n is the number of producers. Okay. Uh, so this means that we assume here we assume alpha, the parameter that determines the shape of the production function. We set alpha is equal to 1. Okay, so uh, with alpha is equal to 1, our production function becomes just uh, y is equal to a times n. So the marginal product of labor It's just going to be simply A, so that's uh, much easier. Um, and as a result, the wage is just going to be 1 minus beta Z plus beta A 1 plus R theta. Um, so you can see here, um, we've really simplified the marginal product of labor, and as a result, our wage is also uh, quite simplified. And this is an expression that you find very often in the literature because the literature uses uh, linear production functions. So let, let me highlight that. Um, okay, and um, this simplification using a linear production function is also going to simplify our labor demand uh, quite a lot. So if you remember, the general expression for the labor demand. Sorry, let me. So labor demand is going to be simplified. Um, the expression for the labor demand that we derived was that the labor demand was given by uh, alpha a the wage. 1 plus tau of theta, this was to the power of alpha, 1 over 1 minus alpha. Okay, so now uh, as we set alpha is equal to 1, what do we get? All right, so we can, um, here, just something we can do is that we can just rewrite, here we can put the one minus alpha exponent here, and we can, uh, so we can put the right hand side and the left hand side the power of one minus alpha, so here we get labor demand the power of one minus alpha, and here you get one minus alpha divided by one minus alpha, so that's just 
um, that's just one here. So you can get rid of your exponent. Okay, so we get that labor demand the power of one minus alpha is equal to the term um, in brackets. Now, if we set alpha is equal to one, one minus alpha is equal to zero. So the left hand side of the equation is just going to be equal to one. Okay. Uh, and then we have alpha in the brackets, that's going to be equal to 1. Then we have a. Then we have the wedge, which is given by the expression there. Then we have 1 plus star of theta to the power of alpha, but alpha once more is just equal to 1. So at the, at the end, the labor demand relation is extremely simple with a linear production function. Um, the labor demand relation is just going to be that basically the marginal product of labor A sorry. The marginal product of labor, A has to be equal to the marginal cost of labor, which is just 1 plus star of theta times W. Okay. Uh, so that's, uh, that's just very simple. So this is marginal product of labor, and this is the marginal cost uh, of labor. These two things have to be equal. Okay. Notice that here the marginal cost of labor involves um, the recruiter producer ratio. That's just that because for any producer that you employ, so this producer is producing A, but for any producer you employ, you also need to have on hand tau recruiters that are here to sustain uh, the size of the firm, basically to constantly recruit new workers to maintain the size of the firm. So for each producer, we need tau overhead, you know, human resource recruiters around. And so which is why the marginal cost of labor is a W but one plus star of W. Okay? And um, now what we can do is combine this labor demand relation, which is particularly simple. We can um, combine it with the expression for the bargain wage. We can plug that in there using the expression we have over there. Uh, in fact, this uh, I could also highlight this uh, labor demand relation in the linear case because it's um, going to be very helpful. So we have a bargain wedge in the case of a linear um, production function. We have a labor demand relation in the case of the linear production function. So now we're going to combine the bargain uh, wage and the labor demand to obtain an equation that gives us, uh, as we'll see, the tightness that's determined by the labor and demand side of the economy. So if we plug these two things, what do we get? We get that A we combine these two things, a is equal to 1 plus tau of theta times the wedge, and the wedge is 1 minus theta z. Plus beta a 1 plus r theta. So that's going to be our labor demand relation here. Oh, in fact, in fact, we can just uh, simplify that one last time. So that's what we have. And then let's divide everything by A, the productivity. We'll get something that's actually easier to handle. So then we get that one. We get that one is equal to one plus tau of theta times one minus beta. So we divide everything by a, so we have z divided by a, because beta, the a disappears, one plus r theta. 
Okay, and that's going to be the daemon relation that we're going to use. Okay, and uh, so this is in a sense our new labor demand, which applies uh, with a linear production function plus a bargain wage. And here's something that's quite interesting is that um, the labor demand, uh, you know, in general, what we saw earlier is that the labor demand was describing an amount of employment as a function of tightness. But you can see in this equation, there is no employment, only tightness is involved. So this equation, in fact, implicitly determines the tightness level. Uh, and so we'll see what that means is that we have a labor demand that we call perfectly elastic. We'll see in the diagram that our labor demand is not going to be downward sloping, it's actually going to be um, horizontal. Um, so here we have a perfectly, so perfectly elastic because um, if we think about the elasticity of labor demand with respect to tightness here, it's, it just is consistent with only one unique level of tightness. Any other level of tightness is not consistent, you know, leads to zero or infinite demand. So that's why we call it perfectly elastic. This is a perfectly elastic labor demand. You'll see that it also means that the labor demand is going to be horizontal. Um, okay, and so in particular, this labor demand relationship. The labor demand, so it's an equation that uh, determines the tightness, and of course the tightness is going to be to depend again implicitly is going to be a function of the parameters that are involved in that equation. Uh, so here we have a labor demand theta d. Um, so now the demand gives a tightness and it's going to depend on the parameters of the model, but in particular one parameter that's particularly What's going to be particularly helpful here is productivity. You can see that productivity shows up in the equation. And so when A productivity changes, the tightness that solves this equation is also going to change. Okay, because if you change A, you change the equation, you're going to change the solution theta to that equation. So in fact, this implicitly, this equation here, this labor demand equation, implicitly defines tightness as a, an increasing function of A, the productivity. Uh, Okay, so that's what we that's what we got. So now we're going to do three things, and which are the same thing as what we did with the rigid wage. First, we are going to uh, compare labor demand shocks, so shocks to productivity, with labor supply shock, shocks to labor force participation. We'll, we'll try to see which one uh, yield realistic labor market fluctuation, and we'll get the same answer as before. It's only labor demand fluctuations that can generate realistic fluctuation. And then we are going to ask the same question that we asked earlier with a rigid wave, which is, can we match the amplitude of the uh, labor market fluctuation that we see in the data with our model? So can we generate an elasticity of labor market tightness with respect to productivity uh, of eight, which is what we see in, in US data? 